right. Good morning, everybody, and welcome. We are here today to tell you a little bit about the truth in taxation uh, that we're going to be seeing coming up. Democrats have been busy here in St. Paul's figuring out very innovative ways to raise your taxes. But with so much going on at the state capitol, we want to ensure that the public, that everybody had the opportunity to, to see the truth and what's actually being proposed with this great, uh, with the massive government growth and government spending. What we have tracked down uh, recently in the bills that have been proposed is at least $9.6 billion of tax increases over the next four years, likely to pass either the House or the Senate, emptying every Minnesota's pocketbook to support their out of control spending. With tax filing day tomorrow, Minnesotans should know the Democrats' budget this year will lead to higher taxes now and even higher taxes into the future to support their aggressive government growth. We have $17.5 billion surplus right now, folks. $17.5 billion. And Democrats in St. Paul are failing their campaign promises of lowering taxes for Minnesotans. So what I'm going to do today is turn this over to my fellow Republican Senate members here today on the tax committee. And we're going to go through the numbers and provide some context. And of course, we'll be happy to take anybody's question at the end of the conference today. Thank you. Senator Weber. Thank you, Senator Johnson. Uh, with the movement of the budget bills, both in the House and the Senate, uh, we, as uh, Senator Johnson mentioned, uh, have tracked uh, almost $9.6 billion of tax increases in these various bills. And uh, as we look at that uh, over the next four years, just a quick summary of these bills is as follows. In the transportation budget bill, there was $3.56 billion of increases. In the housing bill, there was $744 million in Metro sales tax. Uh, there was a paid, the paid family medical leave, which is an estimated $2.9 billion tax increase on every employee and employer in the state of Minnesota. The fifth tier income tax on top of the fourth tier, which was just initiated uh, 10 years ago by Governor Dayton. A corporate franchise tax, over $1.16 billion just for the privilege of doing business in the state of Minnesota. And then the cannabis bill includes $235 million of taxes and, and fees involved with that. Friends, we have a $17.5 billion surplus. Actually, uh, $19 billion surplus, except for the math uh, change that was made uh, by the majority. And uh, yet, the Democrats are still trying to raise taxes on Minnesotans. Uh, we haven't seen the omnibus tax bill from either the House or the Senate. We understand the House bill uh, will be published early, later today. We will be watching it. Uh, and I would also mention that some of the taxes that are included on, in House legislation have been reduced in the Senate or don't exist. But as long as they're alive in one body or the other, the taxpayers of Minnesota are still at risk. And so while these uh, uh, tax increases are being proposed, uh, simply we want to tell the Democrat members of the state Senate that if you don't wish to see your seniors, your families, placed under an additional tax burden of this magnitude, there are 33 Republicans that stand ready to vote with you to defeat these taxes and bring some common sense to the tax policy of Minnesota. And with that, I will turn the podium over to Senator Draskowski. Good morning, everybody. On February 27th, the budget forecast showed the state had a $19 billion surplus. The Democrat trifecta's first major budget decision to build an additional $1.5 billion into base budgets going forward left $17.6 billion of overcollected taxes remaining. This record surplus is a result of a record overtaxation of hardworking Minnesotans. Put simply, we've been taking too much of their hard-earned money. The state is bloated on the people's money while Minnesotans' families' budgets are being pounded by the price of bread, eggs, and energy. The majority spending plan adds an astounding $18 billion above forecast spending needs. Even with $3 billion targeted toward the tax area, 
odds are that most will be spent on tax aids and credits or tax expenditures targeted to Democrat constituencies rather than structured tax cuts for those from whom the government took it in the first place. What we've seen is a series of budget bills that blow the doors off the barn. Democrats are planning to spend the entire surplus. The $20.3 billion increase in spending over the current biennium included in the trifecta's budget targets represents the largest spending increase in the state's history and the largest percentage increase biennium to biennium in 55 years. And those numbers don't include the additional spending that will be enabled through the new tax increases that they are forming. We must remember that 12.5 billion of the spending in this budget is one-time money that will not recur. While it will not be shown as base spending in the budget, it will be a $12.5 billion appetite for government that we will not have money to feed in the next biennium. Lastly, the budget is full of billions of unfunded mandates on local governments that Senate Democrats haven't even began, begun to quantify. Seemingly, they don't care about the impending property tax increases that, that this will force onto Minnesota citizens throughout our state. Minnesotans didn't ask for out-of-control spending. They didn't ask for us to send them, them off of a colossal fiscal cliff creating an inevitable need for future budget cuts or tax increases. Democrats campaigned on tax relief. Instead, we are getting a pittance of tax relief that pales in comparison to the huge tax increases that will hit every Minnesotans when this legislature adjourns. I'll turn it over next to Senator Nelson. Thank you. Thank you for being here today. I'm proud to represent parts of Olmstead County and all of Dodge County. And my local communities uh, have been watching and they are getting more and more uneasy and nervous about what they are seeing coming out of this Capitol. In fact, they're telling me, they're sending me spreadsheets showing me exactly how much it's going to cost them to do the things that are being uh, purported here. And specifically, the pile of unfunded mandates and regulations that are being contemplated will carry large costs for our schools, our cities, and our counties. And you know they have no means to pay for those costs except for property taxes, increasing property taxes. In addition to the nearly $10 billion in tax increases from the state that we've just heard about, the last thing that our cities, counties, and school districts need is additional, additional tax hits uh, to the property taxpayers. In fact, I'll speak to just one. The cost of paid family medical leave alone can be, well, it's estimated that it will be $60 million to our school districts. That's $30 million of payroll taxes to our teachers, staff, school employees, and of course, $30 million for the school districts. $30 million of additional cost to our school districts. Now, unfortunately, these bill, this bill is being kind of rushed through. We're seeing these bills rushed through, and quite frankly, we do not have a uh, impact statement yet from the cities and the counties. So we're not exactly sure. They don't know how much these additional mandates and, for example, the paid family medical leave is going to cost. One estimate uh, is that the counties also will be faced with $60 million of additional cost just for the paid family medical leave. Again, $30 million by those county employees that they will be paying, of course, and then the counties, uh, $30 million of that cost, which again comes from property tax. And that's why we're having this press conference today. It's about truth and taxation, folks. Uh, taxes are due shortly, and Minnesotans need to be aware of what their tax bill will look like next year if the trifecta's proposals go through unstopped. And of course, we must not forget the many campaign promises that were made not that many months ago. One of those by some of the Senate Democrats sitting in chairs now in the Senate chamber 
was to fully eliminate the taxation on Social Security benefits. As you know, we are one of only 11 states that continues that form of double taxation. It is time for once and for all that we fully eliminate that taxation on all Social Security income, and that includes disability income as well. And as you all know, that was part of the agreed upon conference committee report in 2022, which was agreed upon right in this room by House and Senate conferees, and yet the House refused to take up that bill. We are not gonna let this go, folks. We need to make sure that those who campaigned on this promise are true to their words, and we need those uh, public impact statements. It's going to be far too great uh, for our cities, our counties, our school districts, our taxpayers, who are the ones left holding the bag. I'll turn it back over to Senator Johnson for closing comments. Well, thank you, Senator Nelson, Senator Drozkowski, Senator Weber. So it's just common sense with a huge surplus. We don't need to raise $10 million, $10 billion in increased taxes. For the last six years, when Republicans sat in these chairs and controlled this tax committee, you saw prudent tax policy come out of here. And now with the change over to Democrat side, all of a sudden there's a proposal for $10 billion more of taxes immediately. So we had a proposal though. We have a proposal to talk just about this, to counter what the Democrats are doing. It's a better way. It's called the Give It Back Plan. We introduced this a while ago. This lowers taxes for all Minnesota taxpayers and helps families who have been struggling with the rising inflation over the last few years. So here's the truth about our plan. The Give It Back Plan prioritizes getting taxpayers relief from inflation and the rising costs they're facing in everyday lives, including permanent ongoing tax relief, as well as full elimination of tax on Social Security benefits, one-time rebate checks, and a short-term child care credit. It's a balanced approach that helps every family across the state. We have a surf surplus because they have been taxed way too much, and they deserve that relief back. So we've shown you both sides of the proposal, both the Democrat and the Republican. It'll be up to Minnesotans to make their voices heard to legislators by calling, emailing, and most importantly, visiting your elected officials and let them know how you feel. With that, we are open for questions. Your number of times, though, you guys really don't expect that to happen, right? I mean, there, the Senate has already backed away from some of these. The House is not even entertaining all these, although they're entertaining a lot. Is, is, are you just setting the outer bound here? Look, those are the proposals that have been coming up throughout the year. These are proposals that have been seriously taken by, by both the House and the Senate DFL. So as we've seen in, in a number of these bills, things will pop up from time to time, come back to life. That's kind of the nature of the legislature. So this, I mean, these are all things that are on the table. So when you add it up, $9.6 billion increase in, in taxes for Minnesota families and businesses, that's, that's all in the realm of possibilities going forward. In the um, leader's budget targets, there was, I think, $2.3 billion set aside for capital projects in cash from the surplus. Um, I know Speaker Horvin has said that, you know, Democrats will go their own way if Republicans do not want to vote for bonding. I know you guys shot down the, <coughs> the first bonding bill that was the carryover. Knowing that that money, $2 billion more, might be there for tax cuts, um, rebates, is that a way that you guys can negotiate for more tax cuts by knowing that that money is allocated in the budget target for that? Let me catch your name one, one time. Caroline. Caroline. Yeah. Caroline. Thank you for that question. I think that's a prudent question. From the very beginning, we've said that we're open to a bonding bill, right? We, Senate Republicans have never said that we don't want to pass a bonding bill. It was interesting, Senator Nick Frentz on the floor a couple of weeks ago said, well, the reason why we have to put that money into the capital investment uh, target is because uh, Senate, Demo or Senate Republicans voted down that bonding bill. We wish we could have done more tax relief, but because you voted it down, we can't do more tax relief. So to me, it's kind of circular reasoning. There seems to be a pathway forward here that we've approached uh, Senate DFL. We had an offer sheet uh, to do just that, to put more into bonding, to, to vote for the bonding, put some into tax relief, 
Then we also uh, added some for uh, human services, $500 million there, and also for egg, a way of just trying to find a deal that would move us forward. And so we are committed to working to find a pathway for the bonding bill, uh, and I hope the Democrats will engage in doing that. Have you at all offered that prospect to them, saying, you know, we will pass a bonding bill if you allocate X dollars from this capital no. budget? We yeah. have a proposal sheet that we, that we uh, shared back and forth. Can you guys talk about the, I mean, the bottom line? I mean, $9.6 billion is obviously, like, you know, you look at that and you say that's, that's a big number, but, you know, what's the actual impact on, like, the average Minnesotan? Well, the reality of it is, is that uh, these, uh, these in proposed increases are going to affect every income level in Minnesota. Uh, if you look at the uh, items that are included in the, in the transportation bill, for example, you have an increase in the purchase price of a new, uh, new or used automobile. You have uh, increased tab fees, uh, just set increases at the registrar's office. Um, it's going to affect everybody at the end of the day. Uh, and if you look at the proposals that are being, that Senator Nelson mentioned that relates to, to education, uh, you know, I had uh, visited with one of my school superintendents as well. He indicated to me that the proposed increases were going to run between two and a half and three million dollars on his school district. And I said, well, how much additional money are you getting in the per pupil formula increase? He said approximately $800,000. So that leaves him with between 1.7 and 2.2 and, uh, $2 million that he has to come up with, either in terms of local property tax increases or uh, cutting of programs. And uh, so this is the reality that the people of Minnesota are facing. Uh, they're going to be either looking from a local level at increased real estate taxes or loss of services and programs. What are the... Uh House CFO tax plan that was put out as you guys started talking has a $1.25 billion dollar one time rebate. How does that compare to the one that you proposed? And have you been told anything from Senator Rest about whether her bill will have a rebate component to it? I do not know uh, if there will be a rebate component in the Senate bill. I have not been told that at this point. Uh, and uh, I believe that the uh, one point two five million billion dollar rebate. Uh, is fairly close to what we had originally, uh, what we had proposed um, in our give it back plan. And, um, but uh, like I said, we have not seen anything. There has been no bill uh, talked about in the Senate concerning that item. Senator Brian, our, our original plan had a $5 billion rebate program. That, that was for the, that was for the give it back, yeah, okay. I'd like to add something to the talk, to the discussion uh, regarding uh, schools. Uh, I think there was a question: How is this going to impact uh, Minnesotans across the board? And uh, the school uh, business official survey just this year indicated that uh, the cost on a per student basis of the bills being uh, put forth in the House and Senate is one thousand six hundred and two dollars per student. Much of that being in the paid family medical leave. Um, the Stillwater superintendent told his board that it would be $1,675 cost uh, on a per student basis. But now the total new uh, school revenue in the first year under the Senate bill is uh, $782 per person and $1,329 in the second year. So you can see that uh, the bills coming forth here are building further demands on our already tight school budgets. And in fact, a number of my districts have sent me the exact spreadsheets that show the individual mandates and their proposed cost. I entered those into the public record in the jobs committee and also in the tax committee here. Um, so these are all mandates that will need to be paid in one way or another. In fact, some of those uh, uh, superintendents have gone so far as looking at those spreadsheets and they've told me the number of teachers that they would be losing uh, because of these mandates. So everyone in Minnesota will pay for these high costs. The House plan, but not the Senate plan, has also increased fees for things like fishing licenses, park permits, and a few other environmental things. Uh, you all didn't talk about that, I don't think, but I assume that's not because you endorsed that idea. But can you touch on it? 
Sure, that, that's, uh, you're talking about in the environment bill that, that they're bringing forward here. And that's something we haven't, we don't have a caucus position on currently, we haven't been able to caucus that bill yet. But uh, you know, any, any time they're raising fees and looking at that, we have to take a look as a caucus and see what the purpose is behind that and if the return on investment is there or not. But what we're seeing on these tax increases is not a return on investment, it's simply government growth over the next four years at an astounding rate. What is, the, what is the option you guys are offering in lieu of paid family leave that help deal with the goals of that program without the, the employee and employer tax? Yeah, we wanted to speak to that. There is a better way. Uh, it in includes two parts. One, it is a incentive, a carrot, for those uh, employers who are not currently offering paid family leave, well, there's a reason they need employees. There must be a reason they're not offering that. Maybe they're, uh, maybe they don't, maybe they can't afford to. So let's let's help them with that. Uh, for a number of years, I've had uh, the um, paid family leave tax credit, which would allow employers to get a tax credit for, uh, for providing that paid family leave. One of the largest drivers, of course, is maternity leave. And there's a mark, there's in other states, not in Minnesota yet, although we did pass it last year, um, there is a new disability policy for maternity leave or for pregnancy. I don't like that term disability, but that's the insurance lingo. And uh, that would be extremely helpful, and employers could purchase that for their employees. Uh, in addition, that bill also includes a tax credit for the employee who might not have an employer uh, who is providing that necessary paid family leave. And for those of you who know taxes, you'll say, well, Senator Nelson, not everybody pays taxes in our state. Uh, there's, it's a refundable tax credit to the employees. So there is a much better way that will receive that will achieve better results without this massive over two billion dollar new payroll tax. Actually, we have Senator Coleman, Senator Coleman, the author of the paid family leave option. She has to be here. I have high school students shadowing me. I wanted to show them a press conference, so I guess no time like the present. Yeah, so we have the same proposal to address paid family leave that we had last year. Senate Republicans, we believe that paid family leave is a good thing. Expanding access to paid family leave is an important and critical thing that the state must do. But a massive new government bureaucracy, billions in tax increases on small businesses, and a one-size-fits-all one mandate is not a good thing for Minnesota. I have small businesses come to open office hours in my district and tell me, do everything you can to block the Democrats' paid family leave proposal. If one more thing comes down the pipeline that hits us, we will be shutting our doors. And these are main street businesses in my community. Our plan is two parts. One, it authorizes the creation of paid family leave insurance in the state of Minnesota. This is an immediate access, free market approach that will expand access to paid family leave as soon as we uh, pass it in the Senate and the House. It's faster, it's cheaper, it's customizable, and it isn't a one-size-fits-all mandate that is going to crush our business community. It, how insurance companies have described it to me is it will be written as a rider to short-term disability policies. The other half is a tax credit, which offers up to $3,000 per employee per business with 50 or fewer employee, employees, so small businesses, to afford up to 80% of the insurance premiums or other paid family leave related expenses. Thank you, glad I was here. Senator Nelson, could you talk about, um, there's a partial social security tax cut in the House bill. Have you heard anything about if a full exemption or full elimination will be in the Senate bill or at least just respond to the House partial elimination? Sure. Uh, well, um, that's a partial solution when we need a full solution. Uh, we are, as I said, only one of 11 states that continues this unjust double taxation. Um, my hope, uh, and uh, I'm not tax chair this year, so I don't want to speak for uh, Senator Rest, but my hope, of course, is that uh, the Senate will once again uh, pass that full exemption, uh, not taxing any Social Security income. Um, and, the cha and also that will also be paired most likely with not taxing uh, those certain pensions as well for people who do not uh, who are not participating in Social Security. They cannot participate in Social Security because of their uh, job employment status. However, um, I believe that will pass the Senate. I certainly hope it does. We'll be seeing our omnibus tax bill here in the Senate soon. But the real challenge is how is it going to affect Minnesotans? 
And my fear is, and Minnesotans fear across the state, is that while the Senate might once again do the right thing and remove this double taxation, when it gets to conference committee, it will be stripped out. That is the concern. And that is where the action will be. I, I believe, uh, I'm hopeful that the Senate does the right thing, full exemption of Social Security uh, taxation on that income. But the challenge is the, the House and the conference committee. Sorry. That one's fine. Jeez. <laughs> You've been supportive of some of these local sales tax uh, authorizations uh, in the past. It looks like the House bill has just a couple lodging taxes and some appropriations instead of sales tax. How, how big of a standoff is that going to be, do you think, going forward? Um, it is hard to say. Certainly, uh, Senator Rest and I have supported uh, the ability for local communities to um, to go to their voters and make the case uh, for local option sales taxes or local sales taxes. Um, it's one of the few taxes that locals uh, do they get to choose. Are we going to increase this tax or not? Um, I have visited with uh, the House Chair as well, Aisha Gomez, and I know that she does not like. Uh, local sales taxes. She's been pretty public about that. I'm certainly hoping that the Senate does prevail in, in this piece. Um, and I would say, for those of you who might not know about local sales taxes, it's important to know, particularly uh, regional centers, for example, get a lot of use from people outside the region. That's why they're regional centers. That's why one of the reasons we have local sales taxes. And uh, it's a wonderful way to um, uh, as uh, Senator Scoy would say when he was tax chair here, you know, the overburden on those particular uh, districts on just leaving it right with the property tax uh, payers to pay for all of those um, additional needs. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm hopeful that the Senate will prevail. Um, we have, I, I believe, uh, 33 local sales tax provisions that uh, passed out of the Senate. Uh, Senator Rest taxed. Uh, Senator Hoschild and I to uh, shepherd those, make sure all the requirements were met. Um, and then, of course, we had the hearings here in the Senate, uh, and those I'm hoping will be in the omnibus tax bill. In fact, I believe Senator Rest uh, sent that out already, that they will all be in the tax in the tax bill from the Senate. So another reason why the Senate should prevail. To kind of predict what the DFL is going to say, um, you know, the argument has been a lot of these programs, if we're raising taxes, are going to be paying for things that also uh, would help and assist Minnesotans. Do you guys see a way forward to kind of pay for some of these programs that they want to institute, they want to put in, um, without raising these taxes? Well, first of all, there's, a, there's not a free lunch, and, uh, and Democrats seem to think that's a case. If indeed, I'm trying to really capture your question, but if indeed the more we spend, uh, the, the, uh, the was it, is it the, that the taxes are going to be lower? Is that what they're saying? Or what, no, say I'm it again. Saying, I mean, the, the argument will probably be that in order to get some of these programs across, you know, you got to increase a couple of taxes in some places and also, you know, that ends up giving back to Minnesotans in some other areas like infrastructure. That's what I've heard in the past. Okay. Well, first of all, they spend the entire 20 billion above the current biennium to begin with. And then they ran out of money. That's what happened. And their appetite is much bigger than that. And they've got to raise taxes in order to pay for the additional appetite. It's as easy as that. Do you guys feel you had anything to say in any of this stuff this year? As it relates to tax policy, Senator Rest, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, has been very gracious and cooperative uh, with the Republican members of the committee, and I commend her for that. Um, you know, with many of these spending bills, however, if you've noticed uh, a lot of the bills that have come to the Senate floor, uh, they've rejected any and all amendments for the most part. Uh, they are intent on going forward with their plan, and, uh, and they don't uh, really care what anybody else thinks. And so that has been uh, unfortunate. Uh, that, I think, has been detrimental to the people of Minnesota. And, uh, you know, and as we go forward here with the, uh, the tax discussion, uh, hopefully uh, they will uh, come around and, and accept some of the uh, proposals that are, we, are, we are making. Well, we got time for one or two more questions here. So they have accepted no, no uh, proposals that you guys have brought forth? Well, when you, when you look early on in the session with a couple of the bills that we had, the uh, 
and clean air, carbon free by 2030 bill. If you go back and you look at the floor uh, debate that we had on that, I mean, you will see amendment after amendment being offered there, both on the floor and then also in committee. Uh, no substantive amendments were taken on that. If you look back at the, uh, the bill, uh, Senate file one that they had on the floor as well. We spent until three o'clock in the morning trying to figure out ways that, that outstate Minnesota, that Republicans uh, and, and Democrats could get together and figure out ways to pass that bill in a compromised manner. Not one amendment, substantive amendment was taken on that. And that's the pattern that we've been seeing. Now we get to these omnibus bills. And there, are, there are a few things that they'll pick up here and there, but the agenda seems to be baked already and they're passing it through as quick as they can without much help by, by any Republicans, which is really a shame because the Senate has always been, since I've been in here six years, very collegial, where we're working back and forth between the two parties, but now it's like we've been completely cut off. So nearly 50% of the state uh, doesn't seem to have a voice in the Senate chamber anymore. Who joined you on the Commerce Amendment on uh, rare diseases? That was Senator Hoffman, I believe. I think we're good. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Really appreciate your attendance.